Thank you everyone for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch is titled, Do You Have a Disaster Plan? We're joined today by Mike Simmel of Simmel Consulting. Mike is one of the top HIPAA experts in the country, and we work closely with him here at Format Approved. Those of you who already know Mike may not realize that he has extensive expertise in disaster planning, which we're going to hear more about in a moment. So I really look forward to this session. Uh, we've never had Mike on to talk about disaster planning, and so I think this will be very informative for all of us. Remember that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session by entering them into the chat area. In the second half of our session, we'll address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent via email link later in the week. Also, note that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the recorded versions of this event. All right, Mike, let's start with that uh, issue I was just mentioning. We know that you know about HIPAA, but what experience do you have with disaster plans? Well, first of all, Brian, thanks for having me on today, and thank you to everyone that's participating. Thank um, what's you. What's on this slide is that my first, oh, you're welcome. My first experience with a disaster was as a victim. I grew up in upstate New York, and when I was uh, 15 years old, we had Hurricane Agnes come up the East Coast, and basically it parked right over our area of upstate New York, and it kept raining and a dam burst, and we had eight feet of water come through our city. Now, our house only had water in the basement, but our family business, my dad had an electronics store, uh, was completely ruined. We had eight feet of water there. So I lived through the disaster. I worked with our local fire department. I was too young to join, but I worked with the local fire department to help uh, secure the area, and we had to clean up from it and had a lot of experience with Red Cross, and that was my, my first experience with a disaster and got me interested in uh, disaster services. And then over time, I joined the Red Cross, got trained in disaster services, and I managed the Red Cross disaster services in our region of upstate New York for 14 years. And that was through Y2K and then through 9-11. So the Red Cross defines a disaster as anything that displaces even one person for one night, and that means that if you have a fire in your house, that's considered a disaster. Certainly it's your disaster, even though it may not affect others in the community. And then, of course, all the way up to the things that you read about uh, in the newspaper and, and see on television, which would be the fires, the wildfires, and uh, flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, and so forth. So I didn't realize that uh, what my experience was going to tie in, in uh, from a business standpoint there's a Disaster Recovery Institute. It's a certifying body, and I qualified based on my years of experience and by taking the course and passing the test to become a certified business continuity professional, CBCP, which is recognized throughout the world as a disaster planning uh, certification. And I've done a lot of plans. I've worked with hundreds of small businesses, and we got done with one plan uh, the second week in May uh, a few years ago, and then on Memorial Day weekend, the Joplin tornado hit. The company that I did the plan for was just outside of the tornado area, but of course the uh, power was out and the water was undrinkable, and they had to do a lot of things to uh, survive that. And then I've got a, a very large client on Long Island, New York. Uh, it's a $4 billion credit union, and they survived Superstorm Sandy using the plan that we developed. So I've got a lot of experience with this, and uh, I'm going to be uh, happy to talk to people today about what disaster planning is, because a lot of people have a different idea of what it uh, is compared to what uh, they really need when it comes to a disaster. All right, so it sounds like you've got a great blend of both uh, certification, professional training, but also real-world experience. So what is a disaster plan compared with a contingency plan? Let's get into some of this detail. Okay. So the, the terms are not interchangeable. People do interchange them. But from my standpoint, you're working along, everything's going along fine, and then a disaster hits. 
a disaster plan is what are all the steps that need to be taken to get you back or get your organization back to where you were prior to the disaster. So if your building burns down, that would include finding a new location and moving into it or completely rebuilding your building. And then getting all the desks, all the furniture, all the equipment, the network, the computers, everything back in place to the point where you were before the disaster. That's a disaster recovery plan. A contingency plan, in which we call a business continuity plan, is what do you do in the meantime? So after your building burns down, or after you're, you're flooded, or if some other sort of disaster or disruption occurs, what are you going to do to stay in business while you recover from the disaster? It's a lot more difficult than recovering from a disaster because recovering from a disaster is a long-term project. It could take six months or a year to get back to where you were, but how are you going to keep your business going in the meantime? So what you're trying to do with a contingency plan or a business continuity plan is to keep your clients, keep your patients, keep your customers and your employees so that once you completely recover from the disaster, your business is back to where it was before. So many people may not even realize that HIPAA has requirements around disaster planning. Tell us about those HIPAA requirements. Well, HIPAA's requirements for disaster planning really don't have much to do with the recovery of your business. All HIPAA is concerned about is the security of patient data. So when you look at, first of all, where the regulations live, this regulation is sitting in the HIPAA security rule, which is all about the protection of protected health information, which is anything that's got a patient's name and any information about their diagnosis or treatment. So the HIPAA focus, think of this as, as a prism, HIPAA looks at disaster planning from through the, the uh, part of the prism that says all we care about is access to the data if there's a disaster and making sure that the data is secure. It doesn't do anything else. That's the specific focus of HIPAA when it comes to disaster planning, but that's not enough. So that's certainly not enough for the business. Uh, um, let's get more into that then. Why isn't the HIPAA requirement enough for an actual healthcare organization to go by? Because, you know, philosophically, and I think logically, a contingency plan or a business continuity plan should be designed to help the business or the medical practice continue to operate after the disaster. So your motives are going to be different than what the minimum requirements of HIPAA are. And as long as you're going through the process of creating a plan, it shouldn't just be a checkoff for compliance. It's not that difficult to create some plans that would identify what your risks are and how you're going to address them and what you're going to do if there's a disaster so that your practice can survive or your business can survive. So it's a lot more than just accessing data. So let's stick with the uh, HIPAA aspect of it and then maybe look at some other aspects. What do practices need to do then? Well, if you were going to be audited or investigated for a data breach, then the HIPAA investigators are going to have a checklist, and it says, HIPAA says you have to have a disaster plan, a contingency plan, and a data backup plan. So they're going to look at those, and they're going to want to make sure that those are that meet the minimum standards. And again, it's tied to the security of patient data. It's not tied to the survival of your organization. So when it comes to a disaster plan, you have to be able to access information during the disaster. So if your main system's down, you still have to be able to access patient data. The contingency plan says, what are you going to do to continue to operate? And don't, don't think of operate as fully functional and doing everything. Again, it's, it's all tied to the security and the access to data. And the data backup plan is simply to document how your backups occur and what tools you're using and, for example, how often 
the data is being backed up with the new technologies. You can do continuous backup. Basically, every time someone hits a uh, key on a keyboard, it could create a backup. That eats up bandwidth and, and takes a lot of uh, resources, and it costs a lot. You can do snapshots during the day. So you could do uh, every two hours take a snapshot of the last data update, and that way that the most you're going to lose is uh, two hours worth of information. A lot of places will do a daily or nightly backup after hours, and then you have to document what tools you're using to do it. So there's going to be a software application that manages the backup. You're going to have the devices themselves, whether you back up to a small hard drive, whether you're still using tape, or whether you're using some online system that automatically backs up across the Internet. But basically, those three documents need to exist, and they don't need to be very elaborate. There's no minimum standard that says a disaster plan has to be 10, 20, 50 pages. It just has to be, it has to have some information about what you're going to do. And I think this is where it's going to scale based on the size of the organization. If you're a small one doctor practice, your disaster plan is going to be a lot smaller than if you are a large hospital with um, you know multiple facilities and maybe a skilled nursing unit and things like that. Now, Mike, I want to go off script for just a moment here and ask uh, kind of a general question. In your experience, is this something that you know most medical organizations have in place, or is it? Do you typically find that they haven't given much thought to this requirement? Well, my experience, and it's not just medical organizations; it's businesses uh, in general. Don't think about it don't plan for it. And I think, Brian, that, that where we've gone in the last uh, you know, 15 or 20 years, certainly, in my experience, is that people think that disaster planning is recovering their data. And while data has become more important over the years, uh, obviously, you know, the whole healthcare industry has shifted from paper-based record keeping to electronic record keeping. So there's no question it's important. But other things have occurred such as the uh, lower cost of bandwidth, internet bandwidth and things, where now you can do online backups and you've got a lot of companies, I'm not going to mention any names because uh, there are just hundreds of them, that allow you to do online backup of your data in quick recovery sometimes in the cloud. But online backup of data and uh, the electronic tools is now very easy. The problem is that people don't realize that you need people in order to run an organization. So when we do disaster planning for businesses, we look at people and facilities before we look at any of the technology because that's where the problem is. That's where the challenges are. We could recover IT very easily, but we, when I was the CIO in a hospital, we knew that. Our problem was we didn't know that we were going to have nurses and doctors and all the people that keep a hospital going coming back to work if there was a disaster. So it didn't matter that our network was up and running and that people had access to the patient care system. There weren't going to be any people there to do the work. So the hard part is making sure that you've got your staff available and then having facilities for them to work in, which is uh, pretty difficult sometimes when the water gets shut off in a community, there's power outages and so forth. Sure, so that's Most businesses don't think about it. They don't like to think about it. You know, this is an uncomfortable thing, and we're going to talk later uh, about what happens if, if there's the death of a key employee or if someone is suddenly taken ill or has an accident, and that makes people very uncomfortable to deal with. So I think human nature is that it's better to just leave it alone and hope it doesn't happen to you. Yeah, and there may be a reluctance to plan for something if it's unpleasant to think about, but you raise great points about the need to think about the people uh, aspect of it, especially when you're talking about healthcare organizations and medical practices who, you know, might really be needed in that kind of situation. So we've right. talked about the requirements right. Right. there. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let, let me, uh, we'll talk about this later in terms of some of the resources. I'm reading a book right now called Five Days at Memorial, and it's about the Baptist Hospital or the formal former Baptist Hospital in uh, New Orleans and everything that they went through during the disaster of uh, Hurricane Katrina. And it's, it's just amazing in terms of uh, you know what they went through. And I haven't finished it, so 
Uh, it's not that I'm going to give you the, the end of the story or anything, but the part that they made very clear was that because of the way federal funding worked, they had gotten a ton of money to do bioterrorism and terrorism planning. And it, they have hundreds and hundreds of pages of terrorism planning and something like 10 pages of hurricane planning. Brilliant. And these were the people in New Orleans. Right. So it, it really talks about you know how these people improvise. It kind of reads, in some cases, like that Apollo 13 movie where they were using duct tape and mm -hmm. coat hangers to you know put the spacecraft back together. But what it really gets down to is, and, and I've seen this firsthand, and I've talked to a lot of friends that have gone through things like the Joplin Tornado and Superstorm Sandy, you can't make good decisions when you're in the midst of a disaster. It's just that simple. Well, you've given us a good overview of uh, you know, what HIPAA requires, but you, as you stress throughout, that's not enough. So what should practices do to actually survive a disaster? Okay. Well, th th these are some pretty basic steps, and, and these are the fundamentals of business continuity planning and contingency planning. How are you going to stay in business while the disaster is happening in some cases? And the, and the immediate aftermath. Some disasters, the Joplin tornado was just minutes. It was horrible, but it only took minutes. Then you get a disaster like Katrina that floods a city for weeks. And each one of these things has their own characteristics, but at some level, they're all the same. And they're all the same in the sense that you have to figure out how you're going to communicate with people, how you're going to uh, house people and bring people back together to keep the operation going. There's the technology aspect of it, and then of course you have the, the client or patient side of the business. So the first thing is go way past HIPAA and look at the events and the circumstances that could kill the organization. So while it's possible that a tornado or a hurricane could knock out your facility, there's a HIPAA aspect to getting the data back online, but what's going to happen? How long can your organization continue to operate without patients, without performing services, without generating money? Focus on business continuity. Disaster recovery is going to be dependent on a lot of different things. In New York City and in New Jersey, they're still recovering from Superstorm Sandy, which was a year ago. And there are buildings that have not been inhabitable, uh, we just recently saw that big fire on the boardwalk in New Jersey, and that was based on damage to the wiring that was done. So I haven't talked to anybody lately, but I'm sure that that slowed everything down in terms of the recovery because now they're going to be more uh, diligent about inspecting wiring, and maybe people are making decisions now that they're going to have to replace the wiring that they had decided a while ago they thought was okay, but now obviously with this whole boardwalk burning down, they have to change that. So the whole disaster recovery process is just a long process, and you don't have control of it. You don't necessarily have control over what contractors are available. If the uh, government inspectors that do building permits and things like that are available, uh, what plans have to be approved. In some cases now, you've got buildings that have to be put up on stilts above a flood line if they want to stay in that area. What I'm getting at is the business continuity is the thing you need to plan for first because disaster recovery is something that you have less control over. The plan has to be written. A lot of times I'll ask people what their plan is and they'll tell me. And then I'll say where's the plan and they'll point to their own head. That doesn't do anybody any good. If their way, if communications are down and they can't share that information with other people that have to implement it, then the plan is worthless. So a plan needs to be written. Using today's tools, it's very easy to take a plan that used to be in a notebook and sitting on a shelf someplace, and maybe there was a copy at home. It can be stored as a PDF file. It can be put on a smartphone or a tablet. It can be up in the cloud. The problem with the cloud, and I was just at a, a disaster recovery conference with all these companies that are offering cloud-based uh, disaster planning, is that one of the first things that usually goes out is communications. So whatever planning tool you use, you need to make sure that the plan is still in your hand someplace and with enough people in the organization that it can be implemented. So again, it would just 
distinguish or be different between the size of an organization and what roles people play, but you can't have just one person that knows the plan. You have to recognize that you can't make good decisions under stress. So one of the things about the planning process is that you need to test it. You need to go through some scenarios and make the decisions and document those in a testing environment. And it doesn't have to be an elaborate test. We do uh, a lot of tabletop tests where we'll sit down and we'll go through a plan with someone after it's been developed and start poking holes in it. Okay, um, you're assuming that you're going to have power when you come back to the building. What's going to happen if you don't have power? You're assuming that all the people are going to show up. Let's take out this person or that person and say that they were on vacation when the disaster hit or maybe, worst case, they were taken out by the disaster and they're not part of the plan anymore. So what you're trying to do is make simple decisions and have a plan in place so that people know what to do when they're under stress. You might, you're going to be affected one way or the other by the disaster, and people react in different ways. When you look at your workforce, you don't necessarily know who's going to take the lead in a disaster, and it may not be based on the org chart. It may be based on the person's experience and their personality to take leadership, and what you're trying to do is make sure that there's a plan in place that people can fall back on so that they understand what the goals of the organization are. You have to deal with the uncomfortable issues up front. You can't wait until it happens and find out that, for example, you've lost a colleague and now what are you going to do to replace them? Because if you've worked alongside that person for years, you've lost a friend, you are in shock, you may be hungry, you may not have had sleep, depending on the circumstances of the disaster, and flat out you're just not going to make good decisions. So you have to deal with these decisions when you're heads clear in a planning mode, and then stress them a little bit through some testing to make sure that they're going to work, and then make sure that the plan is updated. A lot of times I look at plans, and we talked about the backup plan a little while ago. I was at a hospital recently doing a HIPAA assessment, and I said, I need to see your backup plan, and they handed it to me. And I said, do you guys still really use an IBM System 36? I haven't seen one in years. They said, oh, no, we got rid of that years ago. And I said, well, according to this, you're backing it up twice a day. <laughs> right. So they didn't have any of their, yeah, there, there was no current information. Now, here's the thing. From an auditing standpoint, they may have thought that they were going to pass an audit because they had a plan, but nobody was paying attention to it. And what it gets down to is that the plan isn't just something to have on the shelf in case you have an audit. It's so that people understand what's going on, and then you need to review the plan on occasion to find out if it's really going to work. So what should be included in a business continuity plan? Okay, so in HIPAA, the first requirement is a risk analysis, and that is tied to the protection of the data. A risk analysis is also the first thing that goes into a business continuity plan. So the first thing about a plan is it doesn't have to be a big, thick document. In fact, that works against you. People don't have time to read and don't have time to go through a lot of detailed uh, paragraphs and, and a lot of documentation when they're in a disaster. They need checklist-type information. So when we work with businesses, we'll ask some simple questions. What electronic tools do you use? What software applications do you use? So everybody's got an accounting system. In some businesses, they'll have a separate system that tracks the services that they provide. They'll have Microsoft Office or something like that to do word processing documents and spreadsheets and all those. And we'll ask a simple question. If there's a disaster, what are you going to recover first? And sometimes there's an argument because everyone you know, becomes proprietary and it's their department. Well, you know, we can't. We have to bring the accounting system up first because if we can't collect money and all that, then uh, the business is going to fail. And then, you know, what's the next step and so forth? So we put those things out on the table. The first thing that we need to do is identify what are the risks that can affect the organization. If you're on the East Coast, you're going to have hurricanes and, in some cases, tornadoes as a big risk. You're going to have power failures. Now, sometimes those are tied to an event like a hurricane, 
but in some areas the power grid is weak or maybe you're at the end of the line so you have to identify what those risks are. One of the more recent things that we've seen over the last few years is more of a dependence on the cloud. So healthcare organizations have to have internet connectivity. When I was the CIO in the hospital, we implemented a drug uh, database, an online drug database that replaced our PDRs, our physician's desk reference books. And all of a sudden now our internet connection was tied directly to patient care and in some cases life and death. So what are the risks? The risks of a communications failure, the risk of losing power, the risk of losing key employees, those have to be identified. Once they're identified, then you start a risk management program. So the first thing on the list is always employees. How do you contact your employees? How do you communicate with them? There are weaknesses in many communications plans because they say, well, we're going to email everybody. Well, if you're going to email everybody and your email server is in your building that has no power or can't be accessed or has no communications, now you can't reach people. So we, we developed a contact sheet for our clients that includes how to contact the employee. So it's got the employee name, a personal email account that they're required to have outside of the business account and their cell phone and all that. We also had a place for their spouse information or their partner information so that we could contact the person that they were likely to be with. And then we also added an out of area contact. And that's not somebody that they would necessarily go to, but it'd be the person that they would call and say they're OK. So if they're in California in an area that's prone to earthquakes and there's an earthquake, this is you know calling mom on the East Coast to say that they were OK. We have mom's contact info. So if we couldn't reach the employee, we could contact the mother and say, if you hear from so and so, you know, tell them this is how, uh, this is where we are, this is how to reach us. So some of this is having critical contact information at your fingertips when a disaster occurs so you don't have to think about it. your employees, your insurance company, repair providers, electricians and plumbers and people like that, the utilities. Do you know how, who's got the information right now to call your gas company, your electric company, your water provider for an emergency. And you don't want to have to go and start looking that up. And if the internet's down, you may not be able to find it anyway. Uh, your IT providers. Sometimes it's an IT staff. A lot of times it's an outsourced provider. How do you reach those people at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell them that you've had this disaster? And then where are the shutoffs in your building? I've done disaster planning for hundreds and hundreds of businesses. And when I ask the business owners, where's the gas shut off, the water shut off, and the electrical shut off, fewer than 50% of the people can answer that question. And then if we're at an event, a lot of times we'll go to a conference to do a business continuity workshop, I'll say, OK, you know where it is. If the water pipe burst right now in your office, who's there? And a lot of times it's a receptionist or someone that, that uh, maybe an accountant, a bookkeeper, somebody like that that's working in the office. I said, do they know where to go to turn the water off? And then do they know who to call to get it turned back on or fixed? So a lot of times people don't have answers to the questions. And you're in your building every day. And I worked with one client who told me she was in her building for 16 years. And nobody had ever shown her where the water shut off was. We went that day and found it. It was you know, kind of in a logical place. What we also found was that um, they didn't have a tool that could turn off the gas in their building. So we got a just a um, channel lock type wrench and hung it near the gas shut off. Just so that if they had to do that in an emergency, they had a tool to do it. These are just some fundamental things that can reduce the damage from an event. And then what you have to do is you have to create some plans, very basic steps, do this, do this, do this, for various kinds of disasters. So you're better off to have a plan and have to modify it than to not have any plan at all when a disaster hits. And then no one knows what to do and they're looking for decisions. And you may not even be in the building when that occurs. So you've talked about Superstorm Sandy and the Joplin tornado. That's the sort of thing we're talking about, right? That pretty much covers disasters. 
Well, not really, Brian. So hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes are on the front pages for a reason. And that is that they're, they're huge, they're, they make news, and they affect a lot of people. There are other things that are not necessarily disasters in the capital D sense. Uh, they're either disasters, lowercase d, it's something that just happens to you, or maybe we could just call them disruptions. But these have the same effect on interrupting a business, and you need to have some sort of a plan to follow when something occurs and also build in some contingencies. So if a piece of equipment fails, and, and it could be anything, it could be a diagnostic tool in a medical practice, and you have appointments that day. So what's the plan to reschedule people or to move them to another facility or to get another device temporarily that you might be able to borrow or rent in the event that a piece of equipment fails? It could be your server for your electronic health record system. What's the plan? I ask people this question all the time. Things will happen to you. Just what's your plan for losing your EHR server? And one of the things about technology is, and it's kind of a Murphy's Law type thing, as much redundancy as you can build into technology, disasters will always figure out some way to damage the thing you couldn't make redundant. So in a computer server, for example, you can have multiple hard drives. And hard drives are the most likely devices to fail because they're spinning at 10,000 or 15,000 RPM. And they're the mechanical devices in a computer system. Now we've got SSD drives and other things. But if you just take a regular mechanical hard drive, we know that those fail on occasion. They've designed safety and business continuity right into the uh, operating systems and into the drives where you can have a drive fail and not bring your system down. The problem becomes if something really bad happens and multiple drives fail, now you have a huge problem. But eventually those drives plug into some common board or backplane or whatever, and that's the thing that will fail. So even though we build a lot of redundancies in, there are things that will fail. The question is, what is your plan? Are you going to be able to operate from some other system temporarily? Can you recover into the cloud using an online backup solution? Or if you have to replace the equipment or have it serviced, how do you reach the people that can do that? And what guarantees do you have that they're going to be able to show up? And then what's the plan if they don't? There has to be some sort of a plan. We'll ask these questions. It makes people uncomfortable to talk about them. But Let's just keep going through this so you understand. Here's what we're going to do. And your employees and your clients or your patients are all looking to you for leadership. It's better to have planned things out than to try to make these decisions on the fly. You have equipment failure. What happens if the power fails? So you have the power coming in from the street. Some places have generators. Generators can also fail. So generators are not designed. This is one of the things that happened during uh, Katrina and Sandy. Generators are designed to run for hours, not days or weeks. And these generators at some point were failing and having problems. They're a gas engine, just like a, a car or a truck. So they needed service. And a lot of times generators only get tested for a minute or five minutes or 10 minutes a month. So they don't run for extended periods of time. And in some cases, we found that people thought the generators were there to keep the entire building going, when in fact the generator was there to keep some lights on and be able to help people evacuate the building safely with no intention of running it for a long period of time. So these are things that have to be planned out. Communications failure, burst water pipe. Now, if a water pipe bursts and you have to shut off the, the water to the building, you probably have to shut the business down. We had laws. Um, I, my office was in Las Vegas, and we came in one morning. It wasn't a burst water pipe, but somebody was going around town stealing the valves off of the water pipes that were coming into the buildings because um, I think they were melting them down and selling the copper or the brass. But bottom line was we had no water in the building. We had to shut down for that day only because of that. And that was because the law says you can't have people in the building that, and not have um, water. 
the sudden loss of a key employee. This is the thing that makes everybody uncomfortable. First of all, you might be the employee, so you have to consider what happens if you meet your demise, but it happens. And my wife works for a company, and uh, one of their technical engineers had contacted me at 6 o'clock one morning saying that the call that we had scheduled that day, he needed to move to the next week. And at 6 o'clock that night, he was skiing and hit a tree and died. And I know what they went through. We were doing planning for a group of IT service providers, managed service providers, and everything was theory until the owner of one of the companies died. And he died at 46 years old, had a heart attack. He had been married. He was on his second marriage, but his will still had his first wife in it. He was the only person that could sign checks. And as soon as he died, his company could not sign a payroll check, could not sign a, a business check, couldn't pay for any services or anything, had money in the account, the bank froze the account. So there were a lot of things that we saw happen to that business that could have been prevented with better planning. Uh, loss of access to a facility. You don't have to lose your building. You just have to not be able to access it. And we, we read about these things all the time in terms of some disasters, but also uh, you see the shootings and other things on television. As soon as there's yellow crime tape around a facility, people can't go in or go out. How do you run a business? And it may not be your problem. In other words, it may not be something that affected your business. It could be next door, but in the same office building. So if someone puts crime tape around your building, what do you do? You're in the parking lot. You can't go in. How do you notify your employees? How do you notify your patients? How do you communicate with people? And at some point, you can just shut down for a day or two. But what if this is going to go on for a while? So these are the things that have to be considered when you're doing planning. So what would you plan then if there was an equipment failure? What are the basics here? Well, the, the, the basics are simple. And when it gets into healthcare, you, you've got different kinds of equipment. You've got things that you can literally carry in your pocket. And then you've got you know, big devices like MRIs and CTs and, and other things that are, you know, essentially part of the building, uh, or maybe on a truck that comes and parks in your uh, parking lot and, and provides uh, diagnostic services there. So the first thing is, what's the short-term workaround? What are you going to do? Can you just cancel appointments? Can you move people to another facility temporarily? What are, how's it going to affect your business? It's going to differ. I mean, maybe you're an imaging business, and, uh, or an imaging practice, and your imaging is your workflow. So if you lose a device, all of a sudden everything else stops. Maybe you're a hospital where you have a radiology department and something happens. So we're not just talking about computers and servers and things like this. You have to look at everything and consider what happens, what's the plan. It's just very simple. What's the plan? to work around this. If this device is down and we can't use it for a day, what do we do? If we can't use it for two days or three days, what do we do? If it's permanently damaged, what are we going to do to replace it? And there may be some things that are not just your decision. You may have insurance companies and other types of organizations that are outside of your business that have to make decisions or help you make decisions. So. It's very simple. What's your short-term workaround and what's your long-term recovery? Now, this is something you've already touched on, but, you know, it seems like an important aspect of all of this from what you've been saying is that there needs to be a plan if there is, you know, the sudden loss of a key employee. So if you have this group of people and all of a sudden that guy is not part of the picture, what uh, should a practice do to get ready for that eventuality? Okay. Well, in a way, it's, it's the same type of concept as, you know, the other uh, equipment failure. Obviously, it, it's much more, uh, it, it's going to have much more of an effect on those people than the loss of a piece of equipment. But what's the short-term workaround? So can you get a temporary person in to provide the same services? Do you have to refer your patients to another practice? So what's the plan, and where would they go? And to the other people or to the people at the other end, 
have any idea that you have them in their plan. That's one of the things that we found in the past that hospitals that expect well, we're going to evacuate our uh, critical care patients to a, a location or in some cases with skilled nursing, they're going to evacuate the, uh, the residents and those folks may have you know different needs, different types of needs and you know there may be people that are in kind of an assisted living environment and are self-sufficient all the way up to people with full dementia that can't care for themselves. But do the people at the other end know that they're part of the plan and has it been tested? This is one of the things uh, I told them reading this book, Five Days at Memorial, about Katrina. And one of the things that fell through in the Katrina situation was that there, were, there was a plan to use 600 school buses and have 1,200 drivers available to evacuate the city. And one of the first things that happened was that the school district released all the drivers and told them to get out of town and evacuate to save their families. So there are flaws in these plans. But what's the short-term workaround? Long-term recovery. Can you hire a replacement? What's it going to take to hire a replacement? If this person is a skilled professional, it's probably going to take longer than someone that has uh, you know, less of an education or doesn't have the specialty experience that you need. And then look at the effect on the business. So if this is a medical practice and you lose the leader, who can sign checks? What skills are unique to that person? It doesn't have to be the doctor. We could move the X over any one of those people and they could play different roles in the organization. What skills do they have that you need to backfill? And then from a legal standpoint, but it does affect the operations, what's going to happen if that person died? Who's going to end up owning the practice? And then what's going to happen? So. This, is, this has a lot of implications, obviously, for the people that work there. They've lost a colleague. They may have lost a friend or even a relative. But now you're going to be dealing with the question about, is your job safe? And if you're a patient and the, it's the doctor that's lost and they read about it in the newspaper, the phone's going to start ringing. You know, who do I go to? And maybe I have an appointment today. What should I do? And you have to have some answers to these questions. Oh, you're <laughs> and there's the, uh, I misled you earlier about that animation, Mike. It does, uh, if it can float to another person, so that would be something to keep in mind. It could be this person or that person. Our, uh, our roving elimination of staff there. So here's a great question. You talked about, several times about not having a plan that you just stick on the shelf and ignore. Where should the plan, uh, the practices are developing, where should that plan be stored? Well, it needs to be stored in multiple locations. That's pretty much the simple answer. First of all, it's required for compliance. So the compliance officer, the HIPAA security officer, should have a copy of the plan so that it's available if there's a compliance audit and they don't have to go looking for it. But everybody, it's hard to say any particular person, but if you're in a medical practice, a practice administrator should have a copy of the plan. You may have a facilities person that handles your, your buildings and your utilities and, and things like that, they may need to have the plan or even just part of the plan that affects them. The IT people need to understand what the plan is and there's a section in there that will affect them because if there are 10 different devices or functions that need to be recovered, someone needs to have made a decision what's coming back first. And it's been very interesting. I've been involved with planning situations where I thought I knew the answer, or my answer would have been one thing, and people were adamant that it needed to be something else. And then through the planning process, we also determined uh, with some clients which departments didn't even need to show up if there was a disaster for like three or four days. And then, uh, you know, that bruised some egos, and they weren't considered essential. And we just saw this, and I'm not, this is not a political discussion, we just saw this with the government, where somebody had made a, a decision or a plan at some point, if the government shuts down, what staff are essential? And these are the same types of businesses, or the same types of decisions that a business can make or a medical practice can make. So really the answer is you need paper copies, because if all the electronics are down, the power's out, you may have to go to a book and read it. 
but now we have tablets, we have smartphones, we have the cloud, we have thumb drives. There are a lot of different ways to distribute the plans. One warning is make sure that you manage the distribution properly because as plans are updated, you want to make sure that all the people that have them are referring to the current plan and not an older plan. And how often should a plan like that be updated? Well, it should be updated. I, I would actually say it should be reviewed at least annually. And the reason for that, it goes back to what I said to you before when you know someone showed me a plan that said they were backing up their IBM System 36 computer, which they hadn't used in years. That becomes bad information. From a compliance standpoint, technically, it's not a current plan, so it may not be legal in that sense, but that, that's not what I care about. I care about useful. You don't want to clutter a plan with bad information because that makes all the good information suspect. So I would review a plan at least annually. It needs to be on somebody's calendar, and the responsibility has to be assigned. Now, in our hospital, we had a risk manager who technically owned the plan, and I worked with her on the planning process and everything, but she was the one that would call me and say, okay, it's time for our plan review, and we'd get together with a group and talk about things. And you know, with all this new technology, it's all great, but when you have a disaster, you end up falling back on things like telephones that plug straight into the uh, old copper wiring because the infrastructure to run the electronic phone systems and the fiber optic networks and all these new fancy uh, infrastructures don't even work. So we had to make sure that we had old technology available to us, old dial phones and old push-button phones that would plug straight in. We also had things like ham radios that we were able to communicate with, and that's still effective when all the other communications tools are down. So you want to have this plan updated, you want to have things checked, and then if something significant changes, and, and this happens a lot with IT, I was at a medical practice yesterday that just moved their file servers from their office to a hosted data center. And everything was done fine. And I said, okay, you're not done with the project because your plan still talks about your risk analysis and your uh, contingency plan and your backup plans still talk about how it was last week. So we need to make sure we update all those things. And we're doing that less than a year after those last plans were reviewed. So it's important to change your plans whenever something significant changes. All right, Mike, here we have some additional resources you've provided for our guests. Could you give us a quick rundown of what they can find? And of course, as I've said before, we're going to send these slides out uh, after today's session, and that will give people a chance to get access to these resources. Tell us a little bit about them, if you could. Okay, Brian, well, first of all, because they're blue and underlined, I think people realize these are hyperlinks. So right. when you do get the slides, you'll be able to click on these, and it'll take you right to the document. So we do a disaster checklist every year and update it for clients, and we send it out to the media. If we see that uh, there's a tropical storm forming in the Caribbean or if something is in the Gulf or whatever, uh, you know, something you can plan for, then we'll send it out and ask the media to uh, publicize this and make sure that people understand. And it tells you things like, you know, at, at the first sight, now if you live in the southeast, you know some of these things, but uh, it may not be intuitive to others that when you see a disaster coming, go fill your car with gas. Because in some areas, now in Florida, you can't build a gas station that doesn't have a generator to run the pumps. But I think people up in the uh, mid-Atlantic states in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, figured out the hard way that when the power goes out, they can't get gasoline. So there are things like that on there. And this is just a free basic checklist. Share it with your colleagues. Share it with your uh, families. And uh, let us know there's some contact information on there if there's uh, any suggestions you have. The others are some articles that were written. Will the death of a key employee kill your business? And do you have a disaster plan? And this came off of, uh, these are available on the format approved slash, or format approved.com slash HIT security site where we post our articles. And then uh, the last one is just one of probably hundreds or thousands of Red Cross documents preparing your business for the unthinkable. So there's a ton of information out there on disaster planning. 
And the, the one thing that I would advise people is look at our checklist. It's very basic. It's very simple. You can model your disaster plan after that checklist and have it be effective without having to write pages and pages and pages of words. And the other thing is about a disaster plan in a business continuity plan or a contingency plan, you're not rewriting every owner's manual for every software application and all this. Your IT people know how to recover a system. So what you need to have in your plan is which systems need to be recovered first and, the, and how to reach the IT people. And if your IT people aren't available, perhaps you're going to have some contact information for people that you would call if they're not available. And then when it comes to IT, you have to have something like who's got the passwords that can get into the system if our key IT people aren't available. So there's a basic process for going through. But think of checklists more than you think of uh, creating large books that people have to read a lot of words to understand what they have to do. All right, we have some time left for questions and answers, and we already have a couple of questions from our audience. I'd like to encourage anyone else on this webinar to go ahead and chime in with your questions. It's a rare opportunity to pick the brain of Mike Simmel, so let's start with the questions we have already. First question here for you, Mike. Most medical practices don't think they need a business continuity plan. How could you convince uh, the medical practice that they need to have such a plan. I guess you know it's a it's a question about HIPAA and compliance in general. How do you convince people that they really need to do this? Well, I think a lot of this gets down to a couple things, uh, but essentially it gets down to risk tolerance and the way that people think. If people by nature are just reactive if they don't ever want to plan anything and they just take life as, as things happen to them, then they're probably not the people that are going to value a plan and even want to participate in the process. So perhaps it, it's something that, um, from a business standpoint, there are a lot of statistics out there that organizations that lose their data, something like 80% of them go out of business within two years. If they've lost their data and can't get it back, these businesses fail. There's a compliance aspect to it. I think in the healthcare industry, one of the things that is important is that when doctors sell their practices or have sold them in the past, essentially what they're selling are their medical records. They're selling their patient uh, files, and that's what is going to the new owner of the practice. So there's actually a hard value to this stuff. I uh, wrote an article for, for the FORMED website at one point that said you can look at uh, patient records as if they're gold, and I made the argument that uh, I was actually tied to penalties and what the cost of a data breach were, that uh, losing patient records is like losing six 10-pound bars of gold, and gold something like $18 or $1,800 an ounce or $1,500 an ounce now. So when you look at your patient records and you look at this data that has to be backed up, then there's a hard dollar value to it. There's also a hard dollar value to having to replace employees and having to cancel appointments if a piece of equipment goes down or if you lose connectivity to the Internet. So essentially this becomes a business decision. There's been a lot of consolidation in the healthcare industry where larger organizations are absorbing many uh, single practices, and a lot of them realize the value and the requirements. Sometimes it's tied to insurance. You can get insurance discounts if you have a plan. So these are all things to look at. But essentially, it's like anything else. Uh, most business decisions are tied to money, and there's a lot of history that shows that organizations that have gone through disasters that have not had a plan and maybe not even had adequate insurance went out of business after a disaster, and they could have survived had there been better planning. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question before we wrap up. The question is, do you think that a small one doctor uh, doctor's office can do disaster planning on their own? Or do they, you, you talked before about how it scales and smaller organizations are a little simpler than the larger ones. Do even the small practices need to work with a, an outside professional to be sure this is done right? 
Well, first of all, Brian, I've, I've got a bias because I am an outside professional. And right. Knows that. <laughs> but the, the government, so, so th this has to do with a risk analysis tied to meaningful use. The government's actually issued guidance that said that if you want a risk analysis that will sustain uh, scrutiny, that you should use an outside professional. So what I'll tell you, though, is that particularly for smaller practices, the Red Cross has a lot of information for small businesses. Uh, FEMA, uh, which is the you know huge government agency that handles disasters, has a website. Uh, I think it's ready.gov that has a lot of planning tools for small businesses. So it, it is something that people can do on their own. My concern about this, when it comes to disaster planning, and based on the plans that I have reviewed and the people that I've talked to is when people write plans, they write them like everybody's going to show up, the power's going to be on, all the communication systems will work, and nobody will be stressed and worried about their families. And what happens in a disaster is you'll come in and the power will be off, you won't have internet, your phone system's down, key people are on vacation or away at a conference, or maybe they got in the car and evacuated to mom's house 200 miles away, and they aren't coming back unless you know that they can have a place to live, including the kids, and who's going to take care of the dog because that dog's part of our family. So these are things that we go through when it comes to planning. Uh, I think the simple answer to the question is there are a lot of good planning tools, but people have to really look hard at the situations to determine uh, you know, how to poke holes in those plans because things don't go very often. And you know, as I said, uh, I've said to many, many of our clients, they call these disasters for a reason. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that We're out of time for today, but I want to thank you for joining us for today's Learning Lunch. Thank you. Lots of great information in this session. To learn more about our industry expert, Mike Semmel and Semmel Consulting, please visit www.semmelconsulting.com. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees. Remember that all registered attendees will receive an email with links to both recorded, uh, the recorded version of this session and the slides. So some of you have asked how you'll get access to the slides. Rest assured that we'll have those to you before too long. Format Approved offers convenient, robust online education on HIPAA rules and regulations, including updated business associate agreement templates. Visit www.formatapproved.com slash education slash courses underscore security dot html. That's the first URL on your screen there to learn more about our HIPAA training. I should mention that this training was authored by Mike Semmel. Do you need a meaningful use risk analysis or HIPAA documentation? Visit the second URL on your screen for more information about the products we offer on that front. Visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning launches. The learning launch button will take you to the registration page for our upcoming webinars. Our next Learning Lunch will air tomorrow, October 23rd, and we'll cover the subject of top 10 questions to ask an EHR vendor before a demo, or excuse me, to ask an EHR vendor during a demo. Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming topics, and thank you again for joining us today.